Oh, yeah, Barbara here. Hey, Alon, how are you? Hey, Alison, oh, they're good, how are you? Oh, look at that, Barbara's our third one to join. Okay. Hi, Hi Barbara, how are you? Hi, I'm, I'm all right, thank you. Hi. Hi, Nelson. Hi, Hi how you doing? Oh, wow, you're I'm old. okay. I had a nap. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, it's very late for you. Thank you for, uh... It's 10 o'clock here. If it had been next week, it would have been 11 o'clock. Our clocks change on Sunday, so. <laughs> okay, so you still get the hour. Yeah, it's four hours at the moment, so that's good. Nelson, I'm making you a co-host. Host. I think you already did that, so I'm going to start admitting people now. That was Chris. Okay. Oh, wow, we have a great turnout already. early. Uh, good to see you, Mr. McDonald, amongst others. Mr. McDonald is my dad, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the other Chris. You can be Chris. Oh, it's one minute early. Hey, Susan, Barbara, Evan. Hello. Good night. Hi. Good hey, John. Cleo. And of course, Nelson and Bill. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being so early. So we have a great meeting uh, set up for tonight and hopefully uh, an entertaining program as well. We have our video clips. How many did we have uh, register a lot again? At this point, uh, I just checked about 10 minutes ago and we had registered about 86. I don't know if those Excellent. are unique identifiers, but yeah. <laughs> and I registered 84 times. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't record that then it only records i think oh. each unique email. oh okay uh, yeah. but good to see everybody uh, we're going to give it about two or three more minutes before we get things underway and now we're let's see who are we have our presenters over here john i see is here and since we have uh evan okay so so here I don't know if Ross is going to be joining us tonight, but for I guess I'll start putting it into the chat now. For anybody who wants to follow along with our agenda tonight and some of the questions that we're going to be speaking about, do very quickly. Let me see if I can get that chime off so we uh, don't have that in the background. Beautiful furniture. I have to say, we had an attorney on a conference the other day, and he hadn't made his bed. And it, it was just <laughs> such a mess. And the focus, right? <laughs> and, and he was there on the wrong case. And, you know, sometimes you just got to wonder. Hi, Burl. <laughs> I'm a former student, <laughs> the best evidence professor in the world, Burl Blaustone. <laughs> I like your haircut. Oh, thank you. Thank You're you for welcome. the compliments. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have passed the bar. <laughs> well, I've no, never passed the bar. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Elon. Hi, Hello, Nelson. Hello, everybody. It's the wall. I had. Modern I time. had Skippy Alexander. He was a good evidence professor. He's like disappeared now, though. Okay. I always oh, certainly have a nice start out with 17. Um, hi, Alon. Hello. Hi, May. How are you? Thanks good. For... How are you doing? Good, good, good. Let's see everybody. All Margie, right, so you have a... are oh. you there? I have to apologize for totally missing you the other day. Yes, that's quite all right. I'm really sorry. Lo siento mucho. Ah, habla español. Yo soy estúpido. <laughs> <laughs> that's Spanish, I know. Yeah, let's say I don't think you need to uh, be an expert Spanish speaker to get that one. But okay, so um, 
we have 17, so I guess what we are going to get started. So I guess we will wait for a, a little bit, which will do some introductions and housekeeping and what else. So first matter of uh, housekeeping is our Google Doc uh, that we have specifically set up for this meeting. If anybody wants to follow along, uh, again, uh, I'll just put it into the chat in case someone just came in. The uh, Google Meeting Doc is uh, located at a tiny URL URL, which I've set up so that people don't have to type in there or go to a huge Google Doc. So go to the chat and you can click on that. And you can follow along in real time. Uh, if you still have a question for our esteemed speakers uh, that are going to be coming on, some one or two are going to be coming on later on, please um, feel free to put them still into the uh, roundtable discussion point. We have question number eight, starting from eight is open. So uh, you know, let me share my screen here so people can see exactly what I'm talking about. It's a picture is worth a thousand words. And you can see over here, if uh, you'd like to uh, insert a question for our round table, which we're gonna have later on, please, uh, we still have time to put it in. Uh, it's a more effective way of doing it than throwing around a whole bunch of uh, questions in the chat. Okay, um, I am looking now to see have everybody else. So we have two of our speakers here. Dan Culp said he was going to be, might be a little bit late. And I think Ross was a question mark. So I think we'll get things uh, underway in about uh, four or five minutes. Let me just uh, give a quick introduction. Uh, those of you who do not know me, I'm Elon Weinreb. I'm the co-chair of the New York County Lawyers Association ADR Committee. With us tonight is co-chair Chris Flatgate. Chris, why don't you raise your hand? There we go. So everybody, Everyone. Everybody can still see the, enough of the postage stamps on the uh, on the screen. Chris, we're still only at 19 participants. Um, and then we also have vice chair Nelson Timken, who uh, has the blue background that we used for our most recent CLE program that we uh, set up. That was um, actually no, the, the second most recent. Most recent was a part 137 attorney client fee dispute arbitration training that we did on February 23rd. Before that, uh, which is gonna be one of the elements of tonight's program, we had a January 6th uh, CLE on breaking impasse in both the private mediation context and the court annex mediation context. So Nelson had the private mediation context banner up before and uh, Dorothy Caldi was with us on that program as well as Federico Romanelli and a bunch of other uh, people, uh, some uh, of whom I'm sure everybody knows, Samin Bam, Steve Hockman, Alita Camp, uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson, Nelson obviously was, Nelson was the mediator. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also had Chuck Newman and Pierre de Revelles Lapon. Again, my French is terrible for those people who speak French. So uh, I'm sure if he, he were here, he would uh, correct me. But uh, we had a very nice program with that. We're gonna actually be debuting some of the footage uh, from that program after we hear from our speakers. But uh, the first thing that we're doing tonight uh, is we're going to be hearing from a, a bunch of people who have been very heavily involved in drafting the new, um, not so new anymore, but still new enough, the new statewide mediation, uh, I should say ADR rules uh, for court annexed ADR processes. And uh, this is a tremendous undertaking, also an historical development. So it's our privilege tonight to have uh, John Kernan. Uh, we also had scheduled, I don't know if he's gonna be here, uh, Ross Cartez, who's the uh, chair of the New York State Bar Association dispute resolution section. We also were gonna have uh, Steve Berman, Bierman, sorry, uh, Dan Kolb, and Evan Spellfogel, Spellfogel, who is here already. So uh, we are gonna get things uh, off at around 6.10. That's what I told the speakers to, is, is their uh, deadline. Uh, and we are gonna be introducing them first, but before we do that, a little bit of a late break news for those people who are on the Google Doc. The program I just mentioned, the impasse breaking program, which again, in some ways was a groundbreaking program. Uh, and I'll just write this into the chat, impasse breaking. It's now available for purchase from NYCLA. This was uh, late breaking news. It was just about a week old now, uh, not even, uh, that we finally finished uh, the editing of the video, which you're gonna see some of later tonight. So if you like what you see, up oh, there's Dan Cole. I'll just wait for him to come on. Dan, perfect timing. Thank you for uh, coming, flying over from the city bar. So um, the, uh, as I just mentioned, Dan, you didn't miss anything, don't worry. You're, uh, you're right on time. 
So uh, I just was briefly giving the pre-introductions to everybody before we do that. And, and there's Steve. Okay, so I think we have four of our speakers uh, who are here. Wonderful. So uh, again, no one really missed anything. Uh, we we're just starting out in the pre-introduction. So as I said before, and looking in the chat, the uh, impasse breaking program that I was speaking about before that we're going to be um, showing excerpts from the clips tonight after we hear from our speakers. It's now available for purchase from NICLA. Uh, it also gives you an incentive to join the NICLA uh, ADR committee. And by the way, if you are outside of uh, New York, uh, also some uh, interesting news. I have uh, heard from NICLA's, NICLA's just uh, watching people who have uh, road connections, but the um, or feedback connections. But uh, if you're outside of New York, uh, you know, we have tonight, for example, Barbara Wilson from uh, the United Kingdom. Barbara, I want to uh, just raise your hand. A quick shout out. She's one of our longtime guests for uh, Mediators Meeting Online, which is another program that we run. So thank you very much, Barbara, for staying up so late to, uh, to join us. But if you are outside of New York and practice outside of New York, NICLA is now allowing attorneys who are outside of New York to join in a sort of an associate category. And then you can get the benefit of lower CLE pricing. So uh, for that, if you uh, want to find out about that more, it's either Diana Kosinovich or Barry Chase, since he's the person uh, who's in charge of CLE. I'm just gonna put her email in, bchase at nycla.org. Um, you certainly can uh, follow up with her about that. That is a, uh, a new thing that I've just heard from NICLA and their policies. Okay, it is right about 610. So we're gonna get the program underway. Again, for those people who just came on, uh, I did turn off my chime, so now nobody knows exactly who's come on since then. Uh, let me just put the Google Doc back in the chat so you, everybody new can see it. And you can go there still. There's still enough, perfectly enough time to uh, write in some questions. Uh, we had uh, number eight last time I checked uh, open. Let's see if anybody, no, we haven't had anybody put it in then, but it is a live document so you can go and write in any questions that you would like, and we prefer that. Okay, it is now 6.10, so we're gonna get uh, underway. Tonight's program, again, is focused uh, first on the statewide ADR rules, uh, which again are groundbreaking development. And I'm going to start by introducing our uh, speakers. We're gonna start in alphabetical order. So I'll we begin with Steve Bierman. Steve is the founder of Behrman ADR LLC. He's an independent mediator, arbitrator, and dispute resolution advisor, and a former leader of the New York litigation group at Sidley Austin LLP. He brings 45 years experience in helping parties and clients achieve creative and practical solutions to a wide range of complex business and other disputes. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and as a mediator is accredited by the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, CEDR. He serves as a neutral on several ADR panels, including for the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and the Commercial Division of the Supreme Court of the State of New York. He is the co-chair of the Mediation Committee of the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, which we know as CPR uh, for short, and a member of the CPR Council. He recently was co-chair of the American Bar Association's 2021 Advanced Mediation Skills and Advocacy Institute and recently moderated a panel at CPR's 2022 annual meeting on ethics in the evolving world of remote, hybrid, and in-person ADR. He received his JD degree from Georgetown University Law Center, where he was a member of the Georgetown Law Journal, and his BS degree in economics with honors from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Steve, it's a pleasure to have you along. We also Alana, uh, may have had- Alana, I have to say, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Steve is also invisible at the moment because I'm having a problem with my camera. I'm going to try to fix that very rapidly, but I apologize for not being being um, okay. seen. Okay. That's fine. You know, we're here, we're here to hear from you as much as we're here to see you. But to get your camera going, great. Um, let you know. Let uh, Chris or Nelson know in the chat if there's anything we may be able to uh, to help you with. But thank you for that. Uh, thank, thank you for the, thank you for the the heads up. It's always appreciated. But yes, so Steve is with us. You just have to look for his uh, his designation. Okay. We also uh, may have had uh, Ross Cortez coming. He said he was a, a maybe tonight. So I'm gonna just very quickly uh, introduce him because he did work behind the scenes tonight in giving us a letter from the New York State Bar Association and that we may be showing uh, to everybody who's certainly discussing. Uh, so I am just going to quickly introduce him. Uh, Ross is an industry leader in the field of complex commercial dispute resolution. 
uh, in addition to his work as a member of the firm's uh, commercial litigation department, and that's referring to Ruskin, Moscow, and Faltacek out in Long Island, he is an independent mediator and commercial arbitrator. Uh, Ross was elected to serve as the chair of the dispute resolution section of the New York State Bar Association from 2021 to 2022. And with over 1,500 members, the dispute resolution section is the most active bar organization in the country devoted to the study, promotion, and development of mechanisms for resolving complex disputes. In addition, Ross has done a tremendous amount of work uh, along with all of our other speakers tonight on the statewide rules. And to the extent that uh, he couldn't make it tonight, it's unfortunate, but uh, we are thankful to him for his input and his suggestions. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Chris Fladgate, our co-chair, who's going to introduce John Kiernan. And we're right, going can, you a second, can you give me a second, Alon? I'm uh, taking care of something for Steve, I apologize. All right, fine, Nelson, you wanna flip, flip, flip uh, places with Chris? I would, except I don't have it. <laughs> it's on the uh, Google Doc. Oh. On, just click, okay. click on his link on the Google Doc. Okay, no problem. Uh, let's see. I see the questions. It's about the questions. It's uh, it's on the second or the third page. It's on page two of six. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna find. Page two of six. Ready? Okay. I, I, I can Here's take the it over. Introductions. Going. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, um, sorry, just uh, I was hoping of resetting Steve the link. Uh, so, so John Kiernan uh, is a retired partner and is currently of counsel. Just is it is it John? I'm introducing alone. Yeah, yeah, no, you're yeah. you're you're correct. You're okay. introducing John. Keep yeah. going. Okay, John Kiernan is a retired partner and currently is of counsel to Deborah Voice and Plimpton. Uh, he has served on the firm's management committee as co-chair of its litigation department for 13 years and was chair of its ethics committee from 1994 to 2021. Uh, uh, I said, well, John's coming back in on my link. Uh, not John, Steve, sorry. <laughs> His representations have embraced a broad, ra broad range of commercial disputes and internal investigations, including disputes relating to contracts, purchases and sale of businesses, corporate governance, derivative and class action claims, as well as many other things. John is recognized as a leading litigator by numerous publications. According to Chambers, he's an extraordinary commercial litigator whose instincts and analysis are always spot on. Clients praise his great judgment and recognize him as technically excellent. More broadly, uh, John is the, the board chair of the Prisoners Legal Services of New York and co-chair of the Inner City Scholarship Fund Lawyers Division. He's previously chaired the boards for of the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, CPR, Legal Services New York City, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, uh, Volunteers of Legal Service, the Justice Resource Center, and the New York City Bankruptcy Assistance Project, which he co-founded. Uh, and he was the mayor of Pelham Manor, New York from 1991 to 2000, 1999 to 2001. John is also a past president of the New York City Bar Association, where he previously served on the executive committee and chaired several other committees. Um, there are many other establishment uh, achievements of John throughout his career. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, Nelson, you uh, have Dan Kolb's uh, biography up, or you want me to? Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead, take it away. For Dan, Dan Kolb. Kolb has more than 45 years experience as a litigation partner and now senior counsel at Davis Polk and Wardell, representing a wide range of commercial clients in federal and state trial and appellate courts throughout the United States. He has handled significant matters centering on securities, banking, accounting, and tax fraud, professional liability, contract, antitrust, estate, and constitutional issues. In addition to his work in the courts, Dan has participated as an advocate in numerous arbitrations and mediations. He has also acted as counsel in a range of international matters. Dan served for many years as practice coordinator for the Davis Polk Litigation Department and before that as head of its Washington office. Since becoming senior counsel, he has been actively <laughs> engaged as an arbitrator and mediator. He is a member of the American Arbitration Association's Accounting and Commercial Arbitration and Mediation Panels 
CPR's panel of distinguished neutrals, and is a special master mediating for the First Department, a court-appointed mediator for the United States District Court for the, Senior Dis- for the Southern District of New York, and a member of the New York State Supreme Court Commercial Division Panel of Mediators. Uh, the rest of Dan's bio is available in the, uh, in the chat, uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the, um, in the tiny uh, URL Google. document if you yeah. want to see it. Um, but everyone uh, in the ADR uh, profession and the ADR community knows Dan Kolb as one of the leaders and one of the, the finest supporters of ADR that we have today. Thanks very much, Dan, for being here tonight. Thank you very much, Nelson. And I'll round off our speakers tonight with uh, introducing Evan J. Spellfogel. He is the senior counsel in the Labor and Employment Law Practice of Philip Neiser, LLP, representing management and benefit providers in all areas of employment law, labor, and employee relations. After graduating from Harvard College and the Columbia law, University Law School, Evan served five years with the United States Department of Labor, Office of the Solicitor, and the National Labor Relations Board in Washington, D.C., Boston, and New York. He is an adjunct professor at Columbia University Law School, where he teaches employment law. He has also previously served as an adjunct professor, adjunct professor at Baruch College, Baruch College of the City College of New York and as a lecturer in labor law at St. John's University and at annual labor and employment institutes of New York University, Southern Methodist University, Boston University, and the University of Washington. A former chair of the New York State Bar Association's Labor and Employment Law Section, Evan continues to serve on its executive committee. He also has served as a member of the executive committee of the New York State Bar Association's Dispute Resolution Section. And obviously he's been extremely involved in the uh, preparation and the uh, promulgation of the the, uh, statewide rules. Uh, In addition to everything else that's in in his biography, which you could uh, again get from the Google Doc, Evan has also been a repeat facilitator at Seaman and Bounds and uh, Steve Hockman's commercial mediation trainings, both basic and advanced, uh, run by the New York State Bar Association, which is an excellent program. And a quick uh, shout out to them, May 17th and 18th, for those people who want to get to your advanced uh, 16 hour part 146 accreditation, uh, the New York State Bar Association, again with Simeon and Steve as the, the lead trainers on that, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a ton of facilitators, is running their program online uh, May 17th to 18th. It's probably one of the programs which is almost universally described as the gold standard in terms of mediation trainings. The New All York right, State Bar Association program with Simeon and Steve is probably the finest commercial mediator program there is. So if you haven't taken it yet, please do yourself a favor and take it uh, at the next date in May when it's being given. Okay. So with that, we're going to turn the floor over very shortly to John, who's going to give us a, a presentation of the rules. For those of you who want to actually see the rules, uh, they are available in the Google Doc, but what I'm going to do is uh, in case anybody can get to that, I'm just going to quickly put that link for this into the chat and uh, just write statewide rules so you can follow along as uh, John is going to give us an overview of them. And the other thing we're going to do right now is since we have our nice group of speakers is we're going to go spotlight them. So uh, we'll uh, put uh, Steve up and uh, let me uh, also get here Evan. We will, by the way, in order for everybody to see the speaker, uh, the spotlights on the speakers, you have to be in speaker view. If you're in gallery, you will not be seeing it. So uh, keep that in mind. And let's see who else we have over here. Just so many posted things. Of course, we're going to want to add John, obviously. He's, he's leading us off. There we go. So John has now uh, been spotlighted. And last but not least, uh, who am I missing over here? Uh, da, da, da. Dan Cole. Dan Cole is correct. That's, you just need to find him in terms of the postage stamps. There he is. Okay. All right. Again, so if we have our, our four speakers here, and again, Ross Cortez did uh, help out with us also. So to the extent that he's uh, spotlighted in spirit, um, uh, he's uh, certainly uh, with the, this fine group of folks. I'm going to turn the floor over now to John to give us an initial presentation on the statewide rules. And then afterwards, we'll have our roundtable discussion. So. John, please take it away. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Ilan, and, uh, uh, and thanks to all of you for gathering tonight. Uh, it's a, a pleasure, obviously, to, uh, uh, to have this opportunity to preach to the converted uh, who already appreciate, uh, to, uh, to the degree this group does, the tremendous capacity of mediation and other ADR uh, to, uh, to uh, accomplish resolutions of disputes that are not only faster and less expensive to the uh, parties, but also uh, uh, create the opportunity for parties to have a greater self-determinative role in the resolution of their disputes and advance the administration of justice. Uh, and the, the, uh, uh, we're, we've all been supporters of mediation for a long time. Uh, the area of expansion I'll be talking about tonight uh, is in the area of court-sponsored ADR. And of course, courts have been in the, uh, in the business of trying to settle cases from time immemorial uh, you know, through all kinds of court conferencing and other efforts, but we'll be mostly focusing on the, uh, the efforts to uh, expand the use of what we uh, in the ADR world think of as uh, uh, core uh, ADR activities, most especially mediation with all the techniques uh, that we, uh, we mediators are familiar with um, uh, uh, for advancing the resolution of disputes. And so I thought I'd start with giving a little history of how we got to uh, the rules uh, that, uh, uh, that were circulated uh, by OCA on February 2nd for comment by April 4th. Um, and I guess if you're gonna go back to, uh, you know, one of, one of the underappreciated characteristics of New York is that there's one respect in which New York was actually <clears throat> in the forefront of ADR activity. Uh, it goes back to 1981 where the chief judge was Lawrence Cook and he had a vision of using ADR as a way of resolving uh, as particularly small dollar amount disputes, but ones that are of acute importance to the, uh, to the parties and often uh, cases or disputes uh, that involve relationships between the parties. And for the purpose of fostering um, those kinds of resolutions, he formed and got legislation to support and, le and legislative funding uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, empower uh, what became known as Community Dispute Resolution Centers, or CDRCs. And CDRCs have existed since 1981. In, uh, they exist actually in all 62 of New York's counties. Uh, they resolve thousands of disputes a year. They do it with uh, both staff and me volunteer mediators. About uh, half of their cases are ones that are resolved before a court filing is ever made. And the other half are, are resolved from court referrals. Uh, and they've been kind of chugging along, accomplishing mediated resolutions of disputes now for uh, more than four decades. They provide an interesting infrastructure base for some of the thinking about expansion, but they're also a, a histor historical point of distinction for New York. Um, uh, sort of the next chapter in the, in the ADR story is probably the establishment of uh, by uh, Chief Judge Kay right around the turn of the century of, a, of an ADR uh, advisory committee, much like the one that uh, Judge DeFiore uh, formed in, uh, in 2018 and asked me to chair. <clears throat> uh, that, was, that one was, that committee was uh, uh, led by uh, Margaret Shaw and Fern Scher. Uh, it came up with some very thoughtful recommendations. It strongly endorsed the expansion of ADR as a mechanism for achieving faster and more efficient, the more party-driven resolution of disputes in New York courts. It strongly endorsed uh, expansion of infrastructure in the courts. And when, if you looked 10 years later at, at what its effects were, the number one effect it, uh, it achieved was uh, the formation of the statewide office of the ADR coordinator, and now populated and led by Dan Weitz and Lisa Courtney, and any of us who has had any dealing with um, with court-sponsored ADR knows that those two folks are truly extraordinary talents and energy forces working absolutely spectacular efforts to expand ADR in New York's judicial system. Um, fast forward from there, uh, Chief Judge, Judge DeFiore uh, takes on the job and embarks on her excellence in initiative. And one component of her excellence initiative is uh, uh, the firm belief that litigation too often costs too much and takes too long. Uh, that includes that in too many of litigations, 
maybe probably the majority of litigations, the actual underlying truth is that the cost of litigating the case to a resolution represents such a material component of, or sometimes even more than the amount of controversy that unless the parties can, can, can achieve an early uh, 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 favorable dispositive motion decision in, in the case, as a practical matter, it's actually known when push comes to shove that it can't be affordable to litigate the case to its conclusion. Uh, and that's a, that was a source of frustration to her. She also uh, had, had, uh, was familiar with the 2000 ADR Advisory Committee um, report. And so she formed a, uh, a new ADR Advisory Committee, asked me to chair it and, comp and, uh, and populated it with, uh, uh, with neutrals, with uh, judges, with judicial administrators, with practitioners, uh, with commentators on uh, on on ADR uh, uh, and uh, um, with academics, uh, uh, all uh, people who had at various times supported ADR, so the concept was not one that required much selling to the to the committee, and gave us a two a single two word mandate, which was to be bold in thinking about how to use mediation and other ADR techniques more effectively to improve the administration of justice in New York. Uh, that uh, committee's work led to an interim report issued in December of 2018 that reached uh, a kind of four major conclusions. Uh, the first, uh, unsurprisingly, was that mediation works, that the empirical results of program after program involving court-sponsored mediation uh, confirmed an enormous public appetite uh, probably underappreciated by the public uh, 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 for uh, pursuing early resolution of disputes, uh, uh, but recognition that there were significant cultural barriers uh, to, to accomplishing this. And why do we say underappreciated public appetite? Right. Because, uh, because in many instances, uh, the parties weren't asking for mediation, but when directed to mediation, were settling uh, at enormously high rates, suggesting uh, that this was fulfilling uh, a, a demand that uh, that apparently wasn't fully recognized or that was at least being impe impeded um, uh, by cultural barriers, the most significant of ones of which include, uh, I can't ever be the first person to suggest settlement because that's a sign of weakness and I certainly can't do it at the outside of the case. We have to impose more, uh, more punishment on each other through litigation before we're ready uh, to uh, talk about litigation. I can't talk about settlement, I hate that person. Um, uh, and those things seem to get eroded when, when mediations were taking place. Uh, the second conclusion uh, was that, um, uh, and, and this was uh, 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 in somewhat counterintuitive, was that mediation should take place early. That is, many of the, many of the mediation programs that existed at that time were post note of issue pre-trial mediation programs to see if the trial could be avoided. But what empirical evidence, again, was indicating from places that had experimented with it is that contrary to the, to the sense that you have to battle each other before you're ready for mediation or that enormous amounts of discovery have to be taken place, it's actually very possible for parties to mediate resolutions to the dispute right at the beginning. And it's actually empirically uh, possible for people to take off their warrior helmets and put on their risk-discounted analyst uh, uh, hats uh, and roll up their sleeves and resolve cases early. And of course, the big advantage of resolving cases early is that funds that otherwise would have been expended on fighting each other for an extended period of time been, then become available uh, to bridge the gap between the parties. Um, uh, the, sec the third uh, conclusion we reached, which al also was probably counterintuitive to, to many, and, oh, let me say about the second one that also, while people said you can't mediate a result without, uh, without all kinds of information, uh, people, others responded, well, you know, look, there are a lot of commercial contracts now that say that before somebody can sue the other side, they have to mediate with each other. So they don't necessarily believe you have to have a lot of information. And second, all good mediation processes provide capability for early exchanges of information that's of the type that's truly needed. But the truth is the parties are actually, and their counsel who are good, are actually pretty good at assessing what the relative strengths and weaknesses of their case on are sufficiently uh, to 
engage in serious mediation relatively early on in the process. Um, so the, ne the next uh, uh, big conclusion that was again, had an element of counterintuitiveness to it was uh, that directing parties to mediate even when they weren't asking to do so was worth doing through automatic or presumptive direction of all cases of particular kinds to mediation. Why is that counterintuitive? Well, because obviously if the parties wanted to mediate, you'd assume they'd decide between themselves to mediate. And uh, uh, since mediation is a voluntary process, it's a facilitation of voluntary negotiation between the parties, you can't make them do something they don't wanna do. But again, in case after case, what you saw was that parties who were hesitant to ask for mediation for all the cultural reasons I mentioned and, not, and lots of others, when actually directed to mediation so they had the burden of not having to be the person to ask for it, uh, negotiated early resolutions of disputes at, at such hot, stunningly high percentages of, of cases that you, that you can see this as something that would really have an effect on court dockets and on parties' experience that the, you know, the significant numbers of parties uh, could get out of, of their disputes six weeks after the case began instead of six years after the case began. And uh, that had enormous appeal. Uh, and the, the fourth conclusion we reached was, and, and uh, that we advanced, was that it, if, if you were really going to have uh, a distinctive change in court-sponsored mediation uh, or ADR uh, uh, to uh, pursue some of these uh, processes that were being recommended, you really needed infrastructure. You needed ADR administrators who were dedicated to uh, administering the cases, to assigning them out, to say, making sure that they were assigned to the right mediators, uh, to keeping track of quality, uh, uh, to uh, the pursuing fairness and orderliness and those sorts of things. Um, so, so we reached those four conclusions. Uh, the chief judge um, unsurprisingly found them acceptable, unsurprisingly because uh, we, have, we weren't dumb, we weren't gonna give those conclusions before we tested the, whether they were in the ballpark of what the chief judge had in mind. And her, in her February 2019 State of Our Judiciary Address, said the remarkable words, we are all in. And, and talking about the image of transforming New York into a mediate first, litigate second uh, judicial system. Now, of course, that's a huge distance away, uh, a speck in the distance uh, when we're talking about a state when it has a million filings a year. But the concept that uh, uh, the chief judge uh, indicated categorically she was strongly uh, supportive of. That led to uh, another kind of remarkable uh, um, missive right around Memorial Day of 2019, where Chief Administrative Judge Marks uh, sent a directive to the presiding uh, judges uh, of the administrative judges of, of each of uh, New York's uh, judicial departments uh, saying, uh, uh, directing them to provide by Labor Day uh, a plan for the uh, uh, significant expansion of mediation and other ADR programs uh, in uh, their courthouses. Uh, and uh, the casual observers uh, noted that uh, the time between Memorial Day when this directive came out and, and Labor Day is a time of year generally known by the judiciary as summer, where these kinds of extraordinary efforts don't aren't expected to take place, but they worked incredibly hard. All all the uh, administrative judges did, and they generated these plans by the fall. And uh, 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 the uh, uh, the plans, uh, uh, chief administrative judge was working with the administrative judges on their plans, and there was a lot of active and enthusiastic and interesting discussion and action taking place when COVID hit, uh, hit and uh, it didn't squish. ADR initiatives, as I'll describe in a minute, but it did change priorities and, uh, and uh, uh, cause the courts to necessarily focus on how they were going to contend with the extraordinary challenges of the pandemic. Um, uh, when you when you looked at the 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 plans from the AGs, unsurprised you saw that unsurprisingly, the first impulse was toward the use of court personnel uh, uh, for ADR processes. Uh, there are a lot of things that are good great about starting with court personnel. They're easier to manage, uh, the, there's easy to, it's easy to engage in kind of quality control. It's a great laboratory for trying all kinds of different experiments. Uh, you can have clearer reporting on outcomes. Uh, um, but uh, 
uh, if you're really trying to, you, again, in the state of a million filings, if you're ever going to achieve the kind of ADR that actually makes a dent uh, in the New York judicial system, you're never going to be able to do that with court personnel. Ultimately, any fully realized uh, a program uh, uh, that has significant numbers of, of cases sent to early mediation, uh, uh, it, 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 it critically includes the use of non-court employee uh, mediators uh, who, are, uh, who are brought in and become members of approved panels who are assigned these mediations. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, um, uh, I think all of us who are following this program believe that it is full, at its full ripeness will be a pivotal com component of the, uh, uh, of the ADR effort in New York, even though uh, the courts started, unsurprisingly, with their own internal personnel. But the other, I suppose, uh, first impetus, unsurprisingly, of, of the courts was to go first in the direction of programs that seem to offer the best pro prospects of success. Again, that's something we liked. What uh, we believe strongly that success breeds success. I think I share with many of the mediators in this gathering tonight the belief that there are two kinds of uh, practitioners with regard to mediation. They're the ones who, uh, who believe that mediation can cause, can lead to early, less expensive resolution of disputes, um, uh, even among parties who are ferociously opposed to each other. And even when it seems like no negotiation can be achieved in kind of in ways that sometimes seem almost miraculous. And then there's people who don't have experience with mediation. Um, and, uh, and so part of, uh, part of the goal here is to get the people in the second category to have the experience that so many of us have had uh, to make them converts to uh, to mediation as well. Uh, so where do you where do you start you, uh, with, with that? Well, you, you do it in places where uh, relationships are a very important component of what's at stake in the dispute: family and matrimonial, surrogates court, uh, certain kinds of commercial disputes. Uh, you do it in uh, uh, in places where uh, an early exchange of information would be. Uh, relative of the critical information that really needs to be done is logistically possible, or ones where uh, the early exchange of information isn't, that, or inf exchanges of information aren't really essential to be able to uh, resolve a dispute. Uh, but you, but the idea is uh, to achieve success, uh, so that success breeds further success. Um, so then COVID came along. Uh, uh, it was definitely an interruption to full. Uh, accomplishment of the intended infrastructure, in, among other things, uh, part of the chief judge's indication that she was all in was authorization of hiring ADR coordinators uh, in, in many different courts. And that hiring process was about, oh, 40% completed when the hiring freeze came in as part of COVID. And uh, that uh, you could definitely see, and we, we have some fascinating charts that show uh, what happens to the ADR effort in the places where the hiring coordinators in, are in place compared to where they aren't in place. And it'll surprise nobody that uh, uh, the, the expansion is radically higher in the places where you have uh, the infrastructure in place. Uh, but ADR was, uh, um, I think, um, even with all the shifts in tri uh, uh, priorities associated with the triage uh, imperatives of COVID, ADR was viewed as part of the solution, uh, not part of the problem. And so, Think the, the feeling and the momentum in support of ADR actually continued to grow and the, and the practice continued to grow. So now in most of the last two years when the courts have been constrained in their uh, uh, facing all these challenges, uh, we, uh, the, the, those of us who've been working with the ADR advisory committee and, and, uh, and the folks in the statewide office of the ADR coordinator have spent a lot of time trying to establish the infrastructure, working on changing hearts and minds in trying to develop new programs. Um, uh, protocol, we generated protocols on uh, uh, um, training and mentoring for mediators, evaluations, complaints, enhancing the diversity of neutral panels. Uh, uh, over a thousand uh, court personnel have, have undergone mediation training as, a con as distinguished from you know, uh, uh, conferencing cases and uh, some of the stuff that they've done to try to settle cases earlier. This was distinctively uh, directed to mediation training. 
Uh, there's been a statewide director of mediators who've been approved for panels that has 950 members on it. And since geography was not as critical a factor because mediation was all, were almost all taking place remotely, uh, uh, those, those were available to all kinds of uh, people all over the state. Uh, protocols for mediations for uh, dealing with mediations where there might be domestic or uh, intimate partner violence uh, were developed virtual proceedings protocols, standards of conducts for neutrals we drafted, and so on. And, 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 and there have been a number of, uh, of new programs, at least some programs in really all of the state's judicial districts. In New York City particularly, uh, we've seen uh, an expansion of the extremely successful uh, Manhattan uh, Small Claims Project to other boroughs where thousands of cases get mediated every year with an extremely high success rate and with participant satisfaction rates off the page uh, in what they think they get from their court experience compared to others, because they go and they play a role in resolution of disputes instead of the typical client role of going into a room, watching someone in a suit advocating for them, say things that they don't understand to a judge, listening to the judge come back and then their, their lawyer explaining what just happened to them. And a greater degree of agency has led to, to very positive uh, results. There, been, uh, 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 there was a surprisingly successful opt-in program for personal injury cases in the Bronx, so successful that got exported to other boroughs. And uh, you know, while the idea was that you'd like to presumptively assign all cases, essentially all capacity was swamped by the number of people who opt in, opted in. And the, maybe the most exciting thing about it was the return rate of people who used the program once and got a mediated result. They all said, oh, I had all my cases in front of you. And, uh, and so that experience begets enthusiasm uh, uh, concept was, was, was visible right in front of our faces. There was also a program, Queen Supreme, that was called a presumptive ADR program, but essentially once again, got kind of overtaken uh, by by people who were asking to be put at the front of the list for, uh, for their mediations. Uh, the, the courts in New York experimented with blockbuster settlement dates for uh, uh, where uh, hundreds of cases uh, covered by the same insurers uh, uh, would get resolved with the judges uh, serving as neutrals. Um, uh, uh, one of the rem remarkably successful programs is the New York uh, City non-commercial commercial cases. So these are cases that fall below the $500,000 jurisdictional threshold that exists exclusively in Manhattan commercial court. So they're in New York civil, they get assigned, they've been extremely well managed uh, uh, um, for, for several years by, their, by the coordinator of that program. And they achieve year after year, a 60% settlement rate. And just to sort of frame this, this is cases that would usually take years and have motion practice for years, go up the appellate division once or twice, uh, settle for, settle after three or four years, uh, you know, on the eve of trial or after notice of issue. These cases are getting resolved at the sixty percent level within weeks of when they are initially filed. Absolutely spectacular results, uh, and and an inv invitation to anyone who watches them to say, uh, we simply have to, uh, um, uh, we simply have to give this opportunity to more people. Um, Kings County programs in personal injury mediation and matrimonial mediation. Uh, outside New York, uh, a great surrogates court program in Westchester, another, a, a number of terrific programs in the, uh, in the judicial district capturing Buffalo where the Violante program has been going on for many years and is steadily expanding. And in Syracuse and Rochester, uh, major new family and matrimonial programs in Nassau and Suffolk counties, which have been some of the most uh, enthusiastic about bracing uh, ADR. Uh, in thoughtful and energetic ways. Um, uh, so it, so a tremendous uh, uh, sort of continued steady momentum towards expansion. And for those of us who've been trying to sell this, I think the biggest change we've seen is that when we talk to judges now, the judges have a level of enthusiasm for, for trying this that they simply didn't have when we were first talking to them four years ago. And uh, there, in many senses, there's sort of a feeling that they're sort of these adventurous judges who are trying these new programs and they're succeeding so well that, uh, you know, if you want to keep up and you want to be on the cutting edge, you've got to, you've got to be with, with the effort to try these new uh, ADR programs. So that's, that's the background that leads us
to uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, the set of rules that, that got circulated by uh, OCA in February, drafted after a, a tremendous amount of really, uh, you know, sort of model iterative communication between the ADR advisory committee uh, and uh, OCA personnel, a, a kind of a kind of openness to dialogue that uh, you don't often see. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we talked about doing rules early. In fact, our, our, our 2018 interim report had a set of rules attached to it. But the feeling at that point was that it wasn't really the ideal time for rules because um, there was too much experimentation going on, too much laboratory activity. And it was it, the, the thought was, let's let the laboratory percolate a little bit before we come before we generate rules and we can generate rules in kind of response to the laboratory. Uh, but, and, and that view held and, and had a lot of merit and, to it and still has a lot of merit. The countervailing thought was that uh, um, the rules seemed particularly apt to, to answer a question that judges were asking, which is, well, where's my authority to do this? Uh, and, uh, and so these rules, uh, uh, they provided uh, uh, a, uh, um, they, they take a form of two rules. One is a, a, a directive uh, by the chief judge to the chief administrative judge to promulgate rules relating to ADR. And the second is a set of ADR rules. Now, for those of you who've seen the rules, you see that they are still taking account of that laboratory of experimentation concept. And so they don't try to set the rules on all subjects. They really have three purposes. The first purpose is enabling. That is answering the question, um, uh, where's my authority? And, uh, and, uh, uh, but they wanted to do more than enable and encourage uh, um, uh, ADR. They really wanted to press for it. And so uh, the second purpose was, I'd call it encouraging and supporting. And the, the clearest kind of evidence of that is in the base, the, the central first statement about ADR and the word shall, which it, it, so that it's structured this way. It says, a court shall refer each civil dispute pending before it to an appropriate ADR process at the earliest practicable time, unless. Now, the unlesses here are uh, 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 nods to the reality that there's just no logistical way possible that you can refer each civil dispute pending before every court to an ADR process because uh, we simply don't have the logistical resources in place. And so the exceptions include uh, the referral is prohibited under local rule of court or administrative order of the chief administrator of the courts or designee of the chief administrator. It also include that any party can opt out at any time. You, can't force, you don't wanna waste people's time if somebody's really determined not to mediate, they can opt out. A court can determine that a referral will not serve the interests of justice. And significantly, a court can, de uh, uh, can determine in consultation with a local administrative judge uh, that insufficient ADR resources, including but not limited to mediators and neutral evaluators are currently available. So why structure it that way when we know that, uh, 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 that uh, uh, we can't refer each case because it was really important. And this one went all the way to the top of the New York judiciary to structure it as the shall refer unless instead of may refer. Uh, they wanted to make it much stronger than merely permissive to judges. They wanted to convey the, the message to judges. This is the preferred thing. We know that there are impediments to getting it done right now, but this is where we're aiming. Uh, and uh, it's a, it becomes actually, a, a, I think a powerful statement uh, structured the way it does, uh, even with the limitations that are that are attached to it. Um, and the third purpose that the rules had was framing. Uh, uh, um, that is that the rules identify general uh, uh, principles uh, that would apply statewide. Uh, they set up an umbrella for local rules. There are some small areas where uh, in some fine points of language, some of the local rules that have developed uh, will not be consistent with the statewide rules. They're not much. When that happens, the statewide rules will govern. Uh, and, the, and the answer to that, for those who say, but we already have our local rules, well, but the OCA wanted to have some standard points of, of, of rules, but there's still a lot of room for 
individual development with different practices in different courts, uh, kinds of disputes and demographics. And they have to be. Uh, New York is a very broad state. Um, uh, the, the kinds of, uh, of crowding and challenges to the court system and the kinds of resources that are available are very different among the 62 county, counties. If you just think about the issue that is one of the issues that is explicitly reserved for development uh, later on, the issue is very important to this group of compensation of uh, mediators who are on panels, that is shelved. But you know, a simple example is everybody, I, I think, would recognize that if you look, for example, at the, uh, the Bronx uh, or the Manhattan um, uh, small claims court uh, uh, proceedings. Now that, that, that small claims court is entirely handled by volunteer mediators. Uh, they get paid nothing. About half of them are law students. It's a great experience for them. They achieve great results. They do it as a public service. And I think the expectation is that in the fullness of time, you still would probably have a volunteer program operating as, at the small claims court level. On the other hand, cases with more sophisticated parties, greater amounts in dispute, the ability to pay mediators, unquestionably, those mediators should be compensated. Uh, now, there's a lot to be said, and I, we can talk about it in the, in, the, in, the, uh, um, uh, in the question and answer session about the advantages and disadvantages of various approaches to compensation of mediators on panels. Uh, um, uh, uh, although I think there's a common denominator among all of us who are significantly engaged that says, if you are ever going to achieve mediation at scale uh, 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 in, this, in this state with so many lawsuits, you are going to need uh, to have arrangements that are satisfactory arrangements for the compensation of mediators. Uh, uh, I could, could talk more about whether now is the right time for full development of that and about some of the dynamics of how that compensation might be structured. Those are fascinating issues that warrant a, a, a separate discussion all their own. These rules don't tackle that. Uh, they leave that uh, discussion for the, the separate contexts in, in which they will arise uh, out of a belief that there are too many differences to be resolved by a statewide rule, at least at this time. Uh, so that's that's an issue for another day. Um, uh, we've uh, we've been uh, out talking to bar associations about these rules a lot in the period since they were promulgated uh, in anticipation of the end of the comment period. Uh, we've heard some very thoughtful suggestions about uh, ways that the, the the confidentiality issue should be tightened. We've heard the concerns of people in high volume courts about whether high volume courts are the are the ideal next step in the laboratory uh, uh, of, uh, of mediation programs and try to give them comfort that you know, you've got that, that accept about uh, adequacy of resources that says, how are you going to apply uh, 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 ADR in courts that have 200,000 filings a year uh, for things like family, uh, for things like uh, um, housing uh, and, uh, um, and consumer debt cases. Uh, um, and uh, we tried to give them comfort that what, you'll, what they'll see is what they have seen, uh, the kinds of cases that in housing court have been sent to ADR are things like dual representation roommate disputes or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, a, a case of, cases involving disputes over the distribution of EDAP, the emergency uh, uh, rental support uh, funds uh, that are particularly well suited, but not applied in, in the generality. And, we, and we've had uh, a thoughtful uh, consideration, of, uh, uh, thoughtful comments about the comment that uh, ADR should be, uh, uh, or cases should be, should be referred to appropriate ADR processes at the earliest practicable time, uh, which is something that is sort of an important piece of the theology of this effort that's taking place. And that, uh, uh, many practitioners think is, or some practitioners think is a bad idea because you got to let the case mature before it can mediate. And the answer to that is, uh, in part, is this really is an attempt to change that and to to put to move it to an earlier stage based on those empirical results I mentioned earlier. So we've got a long way to go yet. Uh, um, we're now uh, mediating, I I would say, thousands more cases a year um, than. Were then that were being mediated in New York State in uh, in 2018 when we were started, 
uh, but thousands more is a sort of a small drop in the bucket. You've got to get into the tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands to have a fundamental change in how the process is working. Uh, there will be versions 2.0 and more. And uh, as I say, the uniform prediction is that uh, when you're trying to grow it to that scale, uh, the, the use of, uh, of private mediators who are on court rosters will have to expand substantially. And that's, uh, that's all part of the development we see. But the main thing that we do see is a kind of momentum shift, a kind of, an, uh, of movement towards openness this, this, to these processes that is different from what has existed before. We don't know how far it's going to carry it, but it's sort of exciting to be on the ride. Thank you so much, John. That was extraordinarily comprehensive and informative, as always. So we're going to now move into a uh, next uh, phase of our program tonight, which is going to be a roundtable discussion. For those people who have uh, just come on, we do have a Google Doc, uh, which does have the questions that we're going to be addressing. Uh, we do have still enough time, not too much left, but we still have enough time if anybody wants to throw in a couple of questions, uh, at the bottom of that document, you can do so. Okay, we're going to start though with our first question. And this again is uh, to all of our panelists over here. This is uh, for those people who are following. It's going to be question four. And actually, I'm going to share my screen so we can see some of this as it goes on. And Chris Nelson and I are going to take turns moderating. So this is mine. I'll start us off with question. Uh, it's not like question four, it's, it's point four, first question for tonight. Uh, this question comes from Nelson Timken. Obviously, no one wants to make indigents or poor persons pay for mediation. That is obviously of concern to the court system as it should be. However, there is no reason why persons represented by private counsel and commercial division and other high value business cases should not pay for mediation. Why can't that type of criteria be added, such as commercial division and high value, or let's say $50,000 in amount of controversy, for example, cases to the statewide rules? So that's our first question. Why can't we have a specific carve out for uh, compensation? So I open it up to the panel. Dan, you want to tackle that one? Okay, so Dan is, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Um, um, I, the, the simple answer to that is it's not quite the time yet. And that the, the judgment was that that should come in the, what I'll call the next phase. And it's very clearly set out in the draft rule that that it will be that it's being referred out to the different courts, uh, allowing not just for different districts, but also different types of practice. And it will permit experimentation and so forth with different approaches. Uh, just give you an example of experimentation that's already taken place, which is the use of what we've all come to call the 90 minute rule, which developed out of the uh, volunteering for mediation that John referred to in the Bronx initially. Um, Lisa Denig, who was then the coordinator for mediation in the city, came up with the idea that when the people came in and they would, they would um, get to be uh, handled by the, an appropriate mediator, that they would find the mediator giving them free time for 90 minutes and then they would elect to continue or not paying the mediator. That's worked extremely well. You wouldn't normally have thought that 90 minutes would be enough to get the parties into the mix, but they do get into the mix and then they're ready to pay the mediator. Um, as I think you know, the commercial division has a very different approach where you spend more time in uh, that's free if you're a mediator. Those are the kinds of differences that uh, will be sorted out under the rules, but, but district by district and court by court. So it's not that that's not going to happen or that it, it, you could imagine a system that didn't have that because you'll never have enough mediators if you don't compensate them. It's that it will, but it's consistent with other things. It's going to be a subject of experimentation and trial over time. Hey, Steve, go ahead. Uh, Alon, thanks. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I want to add, uh, add on to what Dan just said and also say that one should never try to follow John Kiernan in, in presenting anything and discussing anything. What a, what a just marvelous summary and um, an explanation of where we are. And one of the things that John said, and one of the things that Dan uh, just followed up on, uh, it really resonated with me. This is an evolving process. 
Uh, it is a remarkable moment that we're at right now that we should be sitting here talking about the adoption of this rule. I think back over my career, I, I suspect that Evan and Dan and John can, can say similarly, the, the just sea change that has occurred in thinking about dispute resolution compared to fighting it out in court in litigation. And that, that sea change has only accelerated, as, as I think was pointed out in, in, in the pandemic. This uh, proposed rule, uh, proposed rules I should say, really sets a viable, sensible framework on which additional changes can be made as thinking evolves and as, as day one becomes day two. And while there are aspects that, as I think John pointed out, there, you know, as you've been making your tour, John, around, around bar associations, uh, you know, someone might point out something about the confidentiality provision or something about the immunity provision. There, there, are, there are tweaks that might be made and maybe we'll get adopted into this rule before it is uh, finalized. But my view of this is that this is such a huge leap forward and one should not let you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good as the saying goes. So it, the, the subject that Nelson raised and that Dan responded to is on a lot of people's minds. And, and as John said, uh, to make this program really go in the long run, there's going to have to be some sensible uh, and, and, and well-adopted uh, program of compensation in certain circumstances. But this is a, just a wonderful, wonderful start as we move forward to continuing to, to evolve the mindset towards resolving cases rather than litigating them whenever possible. So. I'm not sure I've added much, but I, I'm just I'm just so excited to hear that and to know that this proposed rule is on the table and is going to do so much good, I think. And the details, to the extent that they're not all in this proposed rule, will follow in time. Okay. Evan, would you like to uh, comment? There you, go. Wait, you were unmuted. Hang on. Now go ahead. Uh, you can hear me now, I think. Yes. Um, the, the most important points that we should glean from what's going on now is, as Steve said, that this is a very exciting statewide um, situation. We've all been waiting patiently for something to happen. I think the, <clears throat> the chief judge has made it clear that we need to have judges in every court statewide, at every level statewide, with obviously the exceptions for small claims and a few other courts, think in terms first of mediation and not litigation. Some judges have said, in my cases, I don't have authority to send this case to mediation. This presumptive rule will give the judge that authority. The most important thing that we need to come away with tonight, we do not want this organization and the people who are participating with Elan, the county lawyers, we do not want them nitpicking and tearing apart the proposal with all sorts of criticism, suggested changes and the like. It is absolutely essential and crucial that every bar association statewide come out with 100% in support of presumptive ADR as proposed by the chief judge and by these proposed rules. You can submit in a letter which says that some suggestions as to tweaking here and there. For example, the State Bar Dispute well, Resolution Committee has submitted some suggestions with respect to the confidentiality issue and with respect to the insulating of mediators from liability with respect either to their work product or to their being required and subpoenaed to go to court. Um, that is not in the nature of an objection, but rather of a clarification. And those who are in support of and who are propounding these proposed rules statewide have taken it as such. 
Uh, and I think Dan Kolb could probably even s explain a little bit more about what the State Bar Dispute Resolution Committee and its executive committee have done in that regard. The, uh, the, 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 the issue of compensation should not be raised now other than in perhaps a footnote saying the next thing to consider after. <clears throat> Turn it back to you, Alon. Thank you so much, Evan. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for all those great comments. Let me just uh, tell everybody, I did put in the chat, it is in the Google Doc, but for those who want to just get quick access, the little tweaks that uh, Evan was referring to from the NYSBA, this was the letter that Ross Cortez uh, drafted on behalf of the dispute resolution section. You have the link for it down in the chat if anybody wants to look at it. But uh, just so everybody knows, it's uh, the intention for Chris Nelson and myself to recommend to our ADR committee that we essentially track um, that letter. We've all spoken amongst ourselves. We think it's a, uh, a very good basis and a foundation to do that. And we're probably going to be doing that. And as Evan said, not really getting into the, uh, the compensation uh, issue. Uh, those, those of you who know me know that I have much to say about that, but I think that definitely is the right approach that we have to start somewhere. We need a foundation before we uh, beautify the building, sort of to speak. And uh, it's important that that foundation is strong. So that's uh, certainly the view that we have. And, We'll get to more practical stuff uh, in terms of how we're going to actually vote on that uh, a little bit later. Maybe we'll even get the, the NYCLA big organization outside of our committee, you know, to sign on, which hopefully uh, will be useful. But, um, you know, that's uh, housekeeping at the end of the meeting. And for now, I'm going to turn our next question over to Chris Flagate, who uh, is up for it. So, Chris, we're on point number five. Yes. This be question two. Go ahead. Take it away. Um, the, the proposed rules refer to ADR processes. Uh, does that mean that cases could be referred to arbitration or trials before neutrals in order to resolve them? If that is the case, uh, who would regulate the experience and the training required of an arbitrator or neutral in this role? What about the new special master program rekindled by NICLA? Could judges and or parties consent to be sent to a special master to decide a case? similar to a referral to a court attorney referee. Okay. Uh, anybody wants to jump in on that? Well, I'll do it again. <clears throat> um, it really isn't designed for arbitration. And if you look at the list of types of ADR at the beginning of the rule, arbitration isn't included. That doesn't mean it couldn't come to be and there are arbitration programs such as the fee dispute arbitration program that does work. But right now it's not contemplated that, that arbitration would be a central part of this. And let me, let me just uh, add to that. Um, I, I thought in, when I, I saw the drafting and, uh, and, and saw what's proposed, I thought one of the just elegant aspects of this proposed rule is the flexibility that it affords a court in a particular circumstance, in a particular case, to recommend uh, an ADR process. The presumption in this rule, when if, if folks have a chance to look at it, is in favor of mediation. There has to be some reason not to turn to mediation. Uh, and, and, and some examples of why that may be the case are, are set forth in the proposed rule, but it gives the court uh, in an individual case flexibility to make a recommendation of an ADR process without closing the door to what that ADR process would be. So neutral evaluation, for example, it, it is one that's mentioned. And Dan's absolutely right. This is not tilted in favor of arbitration, rather away from it, but it doesn't preclude it. And that, again, I think is part of the beauty of the, the framework. If I could add to that, that's consistent with the whole concept of flexibility here to address the different problems to experiment. And experimenting includes different forms of ADR. So for instance, the experimentation that's going on in the small claims court has been terrifically successful. And, and that's, that's called for some adjustments in the procedure there, which is already pretty good. Um, and um, one of, the, one of the problems with arbitration is that arbitration has forms that are really quite formal and litigation-like, and that's somewhat outside the spirit of what, what the chief judge wanted. 
And so it, it isn't a focal point, but it isn't impossible to go to arbitration. You, you, there are ways to do that too. So the exact language, just so you have it, is where a court refers a dispute to an ADR process under this part, the court shall refer such dispute to mediation unless there are compelling reasons to select another ADR process. In determining whether such compelling reasons exist, the court shall continue all relevant factors, including but not limited to the preference, any preference for a particular ADR process expressed by the parties in the dispute, specific issues in the dispute, uh, whether a party or parties are in the dispute are unrepresented, uh, allegations of violence or harm or risk of harm to any person, et cetera, the availability of ADR processes other than mediation. So it's as Steve described it. All right, uh, we think how we're going to go to our uh, next question. So, uh, Nelson, that is yours, and it's actually very rule specific. So, Nelson, why don't you take it away? That's uh, point six, question three. Okay. Um, the uh, in looking at you're talking about yeah in looking at one sixty point two, sub a sub three, with another. Uh, I think we already covered this, but would another ADR process include arbitration or uh, another uh, or a non-judicial trial? And if so, where would the panelists for that process be selected? In other words, would there be court-sanctioned arbitrators panel or rented judge panel, or would the parties have to get the trier of fact uh, themselves? I, I think that question was very similar to the one before it, and I think it's already been answered, Alon. Yeah, no, I think it, generally it has. It's just the only thing to maybe add the, uh, the aspect of the um, idea that there would be a separate roster of arbitrators. Uh, but again, I think that's that's later on down the line, you know, after sort of the, uh, the initial statewide rules percolate to use that uh, construct. Uh, once we have that, I think then the, we would be able to uh, the arbitrators. But we'll still open up to the panel. And you better have anything to add on well, I would I wouldn't say it's for sure down the road. It it could be down the road because it, it could because the, the spirit of this is mediation primarily or uh, neutral evaluation, which can almost always turn into mediation. It's it's trying to get the parties to agree to resolution, not substitute some new form of litigation. Well stated and. The last question that we have on the Google Doc is going to go back to me. So let me just quickly uh, share that up. And I think we do have, yeah, we have just a little bit more time for some random questions if anybody wants. But this is our last uh, stated question that we have over here. I guess no one took us up on our, our offer to put in uh, questions uh, below seven. So uh, question four. Uh, parties who select their own neutral under the rules, uh, would they be paying the neutral's normal rate of compensation, a special discounted rate? or rate determined by the court? Would there be any free time required? Again, I think that's it's gonna be ultimately settled on a court by court basis. But I think the, the overall drive of this question over here might be if the parties decide to um, select their own uh, person to go either within the rules from, from a roster neutral or outside a roster neutral, does that really affect anything? So I'll turn it over to the panel with that. I, I would I would think that this has nothing whatsoever to do with the current proposals and our panel discussion. But as a personal matter, I would urge that um, any court that is um, uh, asked what rate should be paid to a mediator who's selected privately by the parties should be between the parties to come up with whatever they want to pay or up to that mediator to accept or reject the invitation. Well, and, I agree and, with that but, subject to the exception that if the mediator has agreed to some kind of deal as a, as the uh, a condition for being on the panel and the parties are selecting him because he or she is on the panel, then the panel deal applies. But if they're not on the panel and they say, I want my own mediator. Well, well John, John, actually, I, I'm on both the Southern District and the Eastern District panels. And several times I've been contacted by parties, private parties, to ask if I would mediate a case. And I say to them, did you get, were you assigned the case, uh, was I assigned to the case uh, by the court processes, or did you just pick me privately yourself? And if they pick me privately and they want me to mediate, 
I tell them what my normal hourly rate is, and that's it. Sounds fair. Don't disagree. Yeah. Could, I, could I just put in, too, the, it's not an accident that the rule lists selecting a private mediator first as part of the, as, one, as the options can be taken up. And that's to encourage people to think that way, that it isn't, this isn't that you have to take the mediator who's free or somewhat free. You, you, can, you can go hire your own person and that's, that's okay. It's not only okay, it's the general <clears throat> preference, uh, uh, not least because of the view that, uh, that when the parties agree on a mediator, they've already begun a process of, uh, <laughs> of trying to resolve things together and have, have they've been able to get to that point. And that should uh, always be something that uh, there's a preference in, for, in favor of supporting. And, and one of the interesting things about this approach, I think, is, and again, this is another example of the flexibility in, in the framework that, that's been developed, <laughs> that it, it is a court annexed related kind of uh, 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 programming, but it's not limited to court rosters. The idea is let's find a way uh, that the parties want and can live with and abide by to, to turn early in the case towards potential resolution, whether that is a privately agreed and selected uh, neutral or whether it's somebody from a roster. So again, you have these options. And while we, I think all of us have said a couple of times that the issue of compensation is yet to be determined and in fact, uh, the the rule uh, proposed rule leaves that to some extent at least to the local courts to promulgate their own, uh, own processes. Uh, one can guess that part of that is going to turn out to be a phrase along the lines of uh, or otherwise agreed between the parties or as the parties may agree. So there's a lot of again it's the same mantra. I'm sorry I don't have more original ideas, but it, it's again about flexibility aimed at promoting uh, dispute resolution. In, in the mediation field, it is not uncommon, particularly in larger cases with larger law firms involved, for the mediators to be interviewed by the attorneys for the parties. Uh, the mediators uh, 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 would be interviewed and would be then hired and retained or not by the, uh, the parties and the parties' attorneys. Um, as, as, a, as, a, as an advocate in many cases, where I'm on the lawyer side and not the mediator side, um, I, I find that I want a mediator in the case who's friendly with and knows my adversary. I find that that is the most helpful thing to me and my side in the mediation process. I agree with that. I always used to say the ideal man <clears throat> mediator is the person your adversary trusts most. Exactly, exactly. I, I think this, this might be a good time to just mention that we, those of us who've been involved with this on a working day basis, have talked many, many times about the fact that the objective here is a culture change. That you, you want people to be thinking in terms of settlement, resolution, if that's practical, getting the documents and other things more efficiently, and, and uh, reaching out for the right person to help them resolve their dispute is very much a part of that. And, and the more people find success, and I don't mean just counsel, I mean parties, in mediation, in these processes, in these different forms of processes, the more they'll be inclined to do it again. And as I think John said in his statement, the, that's what has happened in the program that started in the Bronx with personal injury where people were opting in, that they found it was so successful, they want to do it again and again. And, and from the standpoint of the, the neutral community, that's, that's a particularly good thing because it will lead to retention of people privately and ultimately uh, some form of compensation arrangement. New Jersey is the state that has the most advanced <laughs> presumptive mediation program in the country. And when you talk to the people who run that program, which is now sort of 15 years and going and well established and, and late uh, features mediation of probably 150 or 160,000 cases a year, uh, they say that one of the biggest groups of opponents uh, to this initially when it was started was the matrimonial bar. Uh, and now 15 years later, uh, the head of the program said, if you told the matrimonial bar now that their disputes would not begin with mediation before there's any litigation, they'd be rioting in the streets. They can't imagine 
they think it's amusing to, to hear that there are other jurisdictions where people start with litigation because that's so obviously not the way, way to go. Well, thank you all so much for that uh, wonderful discussion. We do have, I budget more or less uh, 30 minutes for our uh, presentation for the clips. And of course, everybody's uh, certainly welcome, especially our speakers to stay on for that. But uh, we do have time for uh, one to two minutes of just uh, a random question. Does anybody have a random question for our speakers before we uh, go back to the old world gallery view so I can uh, put up the clips? No. Open floor. Okay, we have one from Barbara. <laughs> from the UK, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm interested in the 60.2, uh, the regulate the qualifications and management, manner of engagement, it's particularly the qualifications. And I wondered if there were any thoughts about, about that. You're talking about the, the qualifications the of the mediators? Yes, I, that, that's what I understand it to mean. That's, that's, <clears throat> What what are you looking at? One sixty. Uh... No, at sixty point two. Uh, this is the document. This is at the. Uh... This is the authorization by the chief judge. It's exhibit A. Yeah, it's the authorization. It's exhibit A, and then it's it's sixty point two of that. Right. And so so all that sixty point two is is that it, as a matter of form, and this is the OCA saying this. You see that it's captioned the rules of the chief judge of the state of New York. Uh, the, the OCA, uh, Office of Court Administration, concluded that what should happen here is that the chief judge should instruct um, uh, the, uh, the chief administrative judge to adopt rules. And, uh, um, and all, so all that it says is the chief, 60.2 says the chief administrator, that's Judge Marks, um, shall adopt rules for the referral of civil disputes in the trial courts of the unified system to ADR. Uh, now you ask, uh, well, they, do we have thoughts about how the rules should regulate the, uh, the manner in which referrals should be made uh, and prescribe uh, no, certain I, no, so, sorry. sorry, it was actually about the regulation of the qualifications. Oh yes, uh, so, that so, so that, sorry, that's a, there, there are already some regulations about training that's required. It's called Part 146 of the of the rules, which uh, have a minimum training requirements and re minimum continuing legal education requirements. Um, uh, there are some courts that impose additional requirements on mediators before them relating to their possession of substantive knowledge on the subject matter related to the courts. Uh, and those there are actually protocols that already exist on that, and it makes sense to do that. Um, uh, the manner of engagement of mediators mostly is being handled by ADR coordinators. Uh, uh, there, are, there are not a lot of rules that have been developed on that, although there are protocols for things like making sure that the panels of mediators are diverse, uh, making sure that people get fair opportunity to, uh, um, uh, uh, to uh, serve on mediation panels. You know, right now, uh, I, I said that there were 950 mediators on the statewide directory. Uh, probably of the 950, if you asked 900 of them what, their, what is their greatest reservation about the program, it is we don't get assigned enough matters. I mean, we really are uh, the assignment to outside mediators, apart from things like the Bronx program where people come there and are there uh, in, in person for, to mediate cases on the nights that they're assigned is still at, at way earlier stages than we would like, although we understand why they start with core personnel uh, first. But, uh, but there's no question that the rules will be needed for figuring out how to administer the panels uh, uh, effectively, taking into account the reality that mediators who are particularly good may be sought out, uh, um, uh, particularly successful may be sought out by parties. Yeah, and, and if you look at, um... Uh, exhibit B, which is the, uh, the more detailed uh, uh, rule here uh, after the enabling rule of uh, Exhibit A, there is a reference to, as John said, to Part 146 as, as a standard for, for qualification of, of roster mediators. And you know the, the comment you made just now, John, about um, the 950 mediators and the common uh, complaint that there's just not enough assignments. I think if you take a long, I, I know that I know personally that that's true, but if you take a longer view, 
And you think about, for example, in the federal courts, it, it took a while for litigants to really embrace the Southern District program and the Eastern District program. And now those are such highly successful programs in terms of achieving results. Litigants, I find, more and more are not turning away to others, but are turning to the panel. And I think if you take the longer view and understand that we, we are in, you know, at the beginning of a tidal wave of mediation uh, that is likely to continue maybe forever, hopefully, but at least for a while, that uh, the, the court rosters, the state court rosters, I think are likely to get more and more attractive to, um, to litigants. And of course, they'll always be free. As, as several people have said, to choose their own uh, private mediators. Wholeheartedly agree. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists so much, and uh, John, especially you for the uh, extremely comprehensive presentation, and Steve, Evan, and Dan for uh, fielding everything, and of course, uh, for Ross for uh, giving us his letter, for which we could use a lot to discuss, and certainly exciting times, and uh, we hope that uh, the uh, initiative keeps going and the snowball keeps uh, building up speed in terms of uh, getting us into a cultural shift in this great state. So thank you all so much. I'm going to remove everybody's spotlight right now so I can uh, get uh, everybody back to gallery. There we go. So they want us to shift to that. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a couple of video clips played. I budgeted for around 30 minutes, but it's uh, maybe, maybe a little bit less in light of the fact that uh, some of these seeing some of these clips can go for some time. I don't want to have to rush them unnecessarily. If anybody's watching the Google Doc, I could actually speed it up. I figured out a way of doing it. I think we're going to do just the uh, the first two as opposed to the very long one. So to give everybody a chance to uh, get a teaser from this, and then you could purchase it. Um, in that regard, I did put in the chat earlier the purchase link for this program. It is a program about breaking impasse in both private and court annex mediation context. Uh, and you're gonna see that uh, very shortly in a second. I mentioned before about the various colored banners where I do explain it in the uh, video, but a bit, bit of background. The case that's involved in this particular uh, exercise, there are actually five split out uh, amongst various uh, different scenarios, but uh, the overall fact pattern, I'm just gonna put that in the chat. If anybody wants to download it, you're not gonna be able to read it, go through all of it now, uh, so I'll just give you the quick version. But if anybody wants to, to see it afterwards, this is a fact pattern that I came up with based upon a real life negotiation, I never went to mediation. But the uh, premise behind this entire program was what would happen if there were to be a mediation uh, based upon the negotiation which I conducted, which actually started out as a litigation. So it involved a, a company, Super Plumbing Incorporated, that uh, was contracted to perform some uh, plumbing jobs at a development in New Jersey, a small multi-dwelling uh, apartment building. And what happened was, is that they apparently messed up on two of the jobs that were assigned to them, namely the um, setting up of certain risers. They, uh, those are pipes that go from the floor to the ceiling and carry uh, either waste or water. They ended up cutting through the joists uh, of the building, causing structural damage. And in addition to that, they also mixed up hot and, water, uh, hot and cold water lines. So those were the uh, primary you know, issues involved in the case. They did some other work as well, but what ended up happening was is that they submitted a bill for approximately $56,000. And of that, only about 20,000, give or take, was paid. So there was a dispute as to the remainder. And that was the uh, start of this. Now I did mention, you'll see it in the beginning of the clip, this is not the type of case that you usually train on when you go to commercial uh, trade, advanced uh, even basic mediation trainings that are like the programs run that we mentioned before run by Simeon Bound and Steve Hockman. But on the other hand, given the trend now, as we've heard, towards uh, presumptive ADR and towards expansion of ADR in New York, you're going to have more of these types of cases now being handed out. So that's ultimately why I selected it. Also, just was a good case in terms of the way the negotiation panned out and see what would happen. So without further ado, I'm going to pull up our first clip where I explain everything in Super Plumbing Incorporated versus Zorba. And Nelson was our mediator uh, in this particular uh, exercise. And I have to give him credit in that he did this with double pneumonia. All right. uh, he, you might, might not know it from the, from the video because Dallaire, our technical coordinator yeah, here, did a, did a great job. Tonight, so I'm be quick and uh, that actually score. just started. This a second. Designed. Didn't want to do it so quickly. Let me go back for a second. And there, we got to hit pause. 
Uh, as I was saying before, he did have double pneumonia, but you're not going to know it from the, uh, from the screen. So without further ado, let me share up the screen on YouTube and we'll play the first nine minutes and 25 seconds. Then we'll do one more clip after this so you can see how Nelson worked very well, very effectively. We have a wonderful jam-packed evening tonight, so I'm going to be quick in explaining how things work. This program is designed to demonstrate impasse breaking techniques in the context of both private and court annexed mediations. And we are going to be using various backgrounds throughout the evening, virtual backgrounds, to show the differences between the various contexts. When our backgrounds are white or marble, we're speaking out of role, we're neutral, just uh, like anybody else. When we, however, are in blue, as you see from my background now, we are in the private mediation context. When we are in red, we will be in the court annex mediation context, and um, we will be switching throughout the evening. Generally speaking, the program will run in such a manner that we will have a role play of about 20 minutes. The last one will be 15, so that's the exception, but 20 minutes of role playing for the private context, followed by 10 minutes of commentary by our esteemed panelists. And thank you all so much for your participation tonight. Uh, afterwards, which we're going to do it again with the court annex context. So we'll be switching our backgrounds to go red uh, with 20 minutes in that context. And then afterwards, we would have another 10 minutes of commentary. We'll be then taking a break. We'll then have another scenario set out where we go 2010, 2010, another break. And then the last scenario will be court annexed only. Um, you can see the reasons why for that in the, in the fact pattern, which uh, has been set around. I encourage everybody to read the fact pattern um, you know, if you can uh, during this, if you haven't, uh, let me give you a very brief breakdown of what this case is about. First of all, I want to uh, just bring forth a comment that Simeon asked me to make, and I think it's a very good one. This case was intentionally selected as a real life example of a case that was resolved successfully through ADR, but then also was one which could have been envisioned through a, a lens of mediation uh, as probably what's going to be happening now as we go into the post-COVID, hopefully soon completely post-COVID, uh, who knows what, what's going on at any time, but the post-COVID era when courts are now assigning, and, and specifically I'm going to mention Nassau County Supreme, they're not assigning any more cases which are just in the high realm commercial uh, you know, seven-figure sphere. What they're doing now is actually assigning all civil cases. So if you take a look at the Nassau County rules, which are at the end of the fact pattern, which we'll be using tonight, you'll see that the new vision uh, going forward for presumptive ADR is that at least in Nassau County Supreme, all civil cases as of November 2021 are being assigned out to uh, presumptive mediation. Uh, again, there are obviously exceptions you know, that justices can make if parties don't want, but uh, or if the justices don't feel the case is appropriate at the time. But generally speaking, the idea right now is that we're moving forward, we have these cases assigned. So the dollar figures in this case are not particularly high. That is, again, intentional. Um, however, the dynamics involved in the case, I could tell you if you look through the first couple of pages of the fact pattern describing what happened in real life, this case, notwithstanding the fact that it's in the five figures, was negotiated out over five hours. So there are a lot of different considerations that we want to bring forth. And again, you know, it's a, one of the nice things about this case is that since it wasn't actually um, mediated, we have a way of figuring out hypothetically how things would have gone based upon our experiences. And by that, I mean Nelson Timken, who is going to be serving as our mediator tonight, Chris Fladgate, who's going to be serving as counsel for uh, Super Plumbing Incorporated, uh, uh, Dorothy uh, Caldi, who's going to be serving, uh, playing the role of Charlene Collins, and um, Federica Romanelli, who's going to be playing the role of Zina Zarbo, all the litigants in the council, based upon our experiences in both the private and the court annexed context, we're giving you what we think might have happened based upon our experiences from other cases in real life. So we're trying to make this as real life as possible. One word also about caucuses. We've experimented uh, at length, and we are going to try tonight, if there are any caucuses called, to make the caucus a true caucus, which means that we will be muting our speakers or the role players um, so that we will effectively be cut off. If anybody's interested in how we're going to terminate a caucus, someone will still be seeing our, our cameras will still be on. Whoever's in the caucus will hold up an envelope. And if you see from my thing, it says, says end caucus. 
uh, is the signal to us. So that's how we'll be doing caucuses. I think it's the first time in one of these demonstrations that we're going to be doing this technique where people will actually be in a real caucus because we won't know what's happening and we will not be flies on the wall. Uh, we will actually have uh, just only our eyes uh, and not our ears. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, get into our first uh, role play. So uh, if everybody can turn in their packets to page six, uh, we're going to start there. And anything that's in black text happens to be neutral. Uh, anything that's in red text is court annexed the other way around. Anything that's in blue text is private. Anything that's in red text is going to be uh, court annexed. All right, scenario one, my way or the highway. After the parties and their counsel have signed a mediation agreement and submitted pre-mediation statements, both attached, the initial mediation session commences. For the first 20 minutes of the session, Mr. Timken briefly reviews the mediation agreement with the parties and counsel and makes an opening statement, reminding them the elements of the mediation process, meaning that it's a confidential, facilitated negotiation focusing on the needs and interests over positional bargaining, creative option generational, uh, generation potential is encouraged, risk analysis and reality testing in caucuses may take place. And the many costs and efficiency advantages of mediation over other dispute resolution processes, including but not limited to litigation. Having finished this opening statement, and again, this applies to both contexts, so we're going to start though with a private, but this also is the opening jumping off point for both. Mr. Tenkin is about to ask the parties as to how they wish to proceed when Mr. Weinreb intercedes. Nelson, Thank you for your opening statement, but I want to remind everyone here that we're all on the clock one way or another, and especially so in Nelson's case. We has already spent billable time preparing for today for which the parties will be charged. Neither I nor Ms. Zorba want to sit around singing Kumbaya and discussing our feelings or anything of a similar nature because this simply is not relevant. In this regard, here's what's relevant. What we need, all need to focus on is I already set forth in Ms. Zorba's pre-mediation statement. First, SPI's case is meritless. Its workers were negligent and the company should not now be rewarded for this negligence. Second, Ms. Zorba has at least one potential counterclaim of significant merit here. Third, to put a quick end to this litigation, Ms. Zorba is prepared to write a check in the amount of $1,000 to SPI. Four, that's our final offer, $1,000 to SPI. Again, that's Super Plumbing Incorporated, plus the party's exchange of mutual general leases. Chris, I would imagine that you'll need some time to discuss this offer with your client Ms. Zorba and I believe five minutes to be sufficient starting now and after six minutes, so that's going to be uh, when we get down to 11 minutes on our clock here, uh, your time is up and our offer is withdrawn. Time is ticking, so I suggest you move quickly. Counsel, I hear the frustration in your voice and I understand it, uh, but, you know, a lack of participation will not make your client's problem go away. Um, I think the more heads that we get on this problem, the more likely we are to solve it. Don't you agree? Well, I'd first like to hear what Chris is going to say to our offer, because we believe this is a fair and reasonable resolution of this case, and we could all go home. Certainly. Well, we're, we're here to mediate. We're not here to be insulted, and that's what that offer is. Well, well, you know, go ahead, counsel. I think then... Let's, you know, call it a day. Do you have anything to add? You have to understand that there are no sides in this conflict. The solution has to address both parties' needs. Please stay. Even if you would like to leave, uh, I'm asking you to please stay uh, uh, as a favor to me so that we can perhaps collaborate and reach a solution that's to everybody's advantage. Well, if you can do something in that regard, um, I'm willing to give it some time. We'll give it till the end of what we have over here. But uh, Ms. Zorba and I, we want to get this resolved and we want to get it done quickly. So, uh, you know, let's avoid the kumbaya stuff. And uh, Mr. Temkin, Nelson, do your job. I understand. Uh, at this point, uh, I think it might be uh, advisable for us to speak each side in a caucus. I have no objection, but who would you cool. like to have seen caucus? Uh, first, I would like to have the, uh, well, I mean, either side, whichever side wants to go first, that's fine. We were the first ones to speak. We'll let the uh, plaintiff have the first caucus. Okay. So I think, uh, just getting back to uh, 
controls over here. I think I'm back here. Is, uh, is everybody hearing me? Yep, hearing you. Now what we're going to do is we're going to show you one of the court uh, annex context uh, segments, which is coming up later. And yeah, we'll still have enough time for that. And then, then we're going to you know, just let people see what they think. And if, uh, again, anybody wants to purchase this, let me uh, go back to the uh, chat. I did put it in there before, but we did have some people who came, came on a little bit late. So I'm going to put this in the chat again. And anybody wants to purchase this, again, it's a great incentive to become a member of the NICLA ADR committee, because you do get a discounted rate uh, if you are a NICLA member for purchasing this. It actually, though, is I'll tell you everybody, if anybody wants, it's four credits. You get four credits for $95 if you're a non-member. It goes down to 75 if you are a member. So uh, it's very useful, but it's it's also very entertaining. We found uh, the reaction for this program was, uh, was that it was pretty entertaining from uh, what everybody said. All right, so we're going to go now next to another scenario and it comes much later down in the program. And this program is three hours and 20 minutes long. Uh, we're not going to see any of the critiques. Uh, that uh, can be done at another time because those take uh, much longer. We have, we have the panelists doing critiques uh, and giving their feedback, which was extremely, extremely valuable to everybody. But we're going to have Nelson again in a uh, scenario called Let Me Die with the Philistines, which is going to involve the court annex mediation uh, context, and I'm pulling that up right now. Okay, got it. Second, if share sound, and there we are. What I was going to say is that I am going down, but everyone is going to die with me. I want everyone here to know that I have not received any rent since 2020. And um, don't think that I am trying to negotiate or trying to play a role or um, in some type of a tactic. I firmly believe that SPI is not entitled to one cent here. And- um, Liar. I thought I heard something, but I was supposed to be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I um, if I end up losing in court, which I don't think it's going to happen, I will do everything that is in my power, including, but not limited to declaring bankruptcy. And uh, I will even represent myself. But uh, what I want to do is make sure that SPI will not get any money. Um, I told you. So even if this means my financial death, I don't care. I'm going and down and you're coming down with me. And just to make a representation as counsel, we're back to the $1,000 uh, as nuisance value as was stated in the pre-mediation statement. We've retracted back to that position. I told you they're not honest. They're not. We see it now. Mr. Temkin, you care to respond to that? You're on mute. I know that you find this upsetting, but it's just declared a war against my finances and my right. reputation. Of course, I'm upset. Please let her finish the statement so that I can. You're biased. Get involved. Okay. Well, it's actually finished. I am not thinking about paying anything. They don't deserve it. And uh, I don't think it's worth their time to to pursue me. I understand that this situation is painful for both of you. And uh, I understand that each of you feels that you're right. But as I've said before, we need to get together rather than each of us staying in our own separate silos. We need to try to fashion a resolution to the situation. And I would like to very much help you do that. Uh, what I suggest now is I would like to speak to Ms. Zorba and her attorney uh, in a uh, in a caucus, if if that would be possible. 
Ms. Zorba. Yes. We have discussed before in another scenario of uh, the financial impact that this has had on you. And as I told you, I'm, I'm very sympathetic. Uh, but I, I think um, you have to think about what is available to you as a remedy and what may not be available. You run a business involving real estate, correct? Yes. Uh, have you considered the effect that a bankruptcy might have upon your business? Of course. I'm a businesswoman. What if you wanted to refinance your property? What would the bank see in terms of a bankruptcy? Well, I'm pretty much there anyway. Well, you're, you're never there until you're there. And uh, it, in my experience, will have an extremely negative impact on your ability to refinance the property, should you wish to do so, should you wish to someday expand. Do you know how many years a bankruptcy stays on your record? 10 years. That's a very long time. You certainly don't want to have that on your record for 10 But years. I certainly don't want to pay them either. Well, we can come up with some options. We they can pay come me? up with options by which you can pay less and make some payments in the future. And they don't get... deserve a cent. Well, uh, that's your opinion, but that may not be the opinion of a jury who's hearing this case. Mr. Tenkin, before you terrorize my client any further, let me just point I'm out to you. I'm not terrorizing her. Well, I think you are. He, he, telling here's, here's, her that there are other options. Other yeah, than other options, which include waiting. basically are capitulating. Keep, keep in mind, Mr. Tenkin, I think you're missing something over here, which is that just the reality of the situation is there's no money coming in right now. All right? Right. We're, looking, we're looking at a bottomless pit. A bottomless pit of despair, all right, whether it's caused by COVID or whether it's caused by recalcitrant tenants. You talk about paying over time, all right? Well, yeah, if we had 500 years, we all have extraordinarily lengthy lifespans because somehow the virus mutates and makes us live for that long, great. You know, maybe that would, that would be wonderful. But in the realm of reality, as opposed to where I think you're coming from, we have to come up with something that you talk but about. But you don't options. believe that that's going to last forever. Otherwise, no, how would but, you get but, paid? But what's the story now? How do we deal with this now, Mr. Temkin? I'm not hearing it. If you, you want to come up with options, they're not coming up with options. Their options are $35,000. Uh, I'll just let tell me, you, Ms. Zorba doesn't have. Ms. Zorba let doesn't me have speak to them about. Let me speak to them about what other possibilities are out there. You're, you're putting the cart before the horse, Mr. Weinrib. Well, Let's talk. And see what we can do you before heard, we give up the game. You, know, you heard Ms. Collins before. She views this as we just declared war on her. Why would they even bother going to do that? And in fact, this is that we really don't because have much Because they're upset. And when people are upset, they say things out of pain and anguish. And that doesn't mean that that's how they really feel. It's just them expressing their upsetment. Well, I want to hear them. We've been in caucus going back and forth the entire time. And, you know, to a certain extent with, with the process, I understand there's certain things that you want, want to come out in a confidential manner in caucus. But I want to hear it from them in a, in a joint session. I want to really I'm hear willing to go back and forth as long as it takes. And I'll give you half price on my rate. How about that? No, it's not the issue so much about the not money. The money. The money. It's, it's not the, the money. It's the getting issue. people together. Yes, That's it's important. getting people together. Let's get out of caucus, bring everybody back, and let's hear what they have to say to our faces, as opposed to going back and forth. No problem. Let's end this caucus then. Okay. All right. So I think everybody gets a, a flavor for uh, the difference in, in terms of the, uh, the context that we had. Uh, for those who are interested as to whether or not that scenario where one person is willing to go down with a ship, sort of to speak, can ever occur in the private context. It does happen on occasion, but it's been my experience that it happens more in court annex mediations where you have already effective a, a litigation that's already been started out. And this goes back to what uh, John 
and uh, the rest of our panelists were talking about earlier about the initiative to try to get these cases resolved uh, on an earlier standpoint more than a later standpoint one of the biggest barriers that you have to that in the court annex context is simply a lack of resources and how you work around that uh when that lack of resources causes an impasse how are you able to uh to break through that so for those people who are interested again uh, these are teasers you can uh see this if you are a member of the nycla adr committee we have gotten authorization from barry chase who is our director of CLE for those people who are members of the committee to be given access to a download to a uh, not a downloadable link, sorry, to a streaming link where you can see the entirety of the video. Um, the, what you saw in YouTube is my personal back channel, which is not open to anybody. The reason why I did that is so that I could play around with clips and move speeds and what else. But essentially, it's the same video you would get from from NYCLA directly. All right, so with that, it is uh, 7.53 right now. There are excellent portions, by the way, dealing with critiques of the scenarios. The problem is, is that without seeing the full scenario in, in play over here, they're not going to make much sense. But uh, for those who are interested in what Simeon Baum, who was uh, one of our lead panelists, had to say, you can certainly check out my YouTube channel. That is available to the public. You wanted a certain epilogue uh, about the program to be stated to the public. That's actually folded into the final version of the video. But he had some very interesting comments about the humanity of mediation uh, and how people shouldn't get so off put by this uh, program because it's not typical. It's not what you're usually going to find. But it uh, this program, I think, does fill a gap in terms of training where people come out from these programs, from Simeon's program or any other basic or advanced for that matter mediation training program, and they really don't have an uh, understanding of what's going to go on in the court annex context vis-a-vis uh, -vis the private context and there are differences between the two of them some of which we talked about tonight we mentioned for example the 90 minute rule all the various rules that were spoken about tonight that are now going to be grafted on to uh, all of the court annexed you know processes in new york state to some extent we're going to have the state rules trumping the, the local rules so there there are certainly differences between that and the straight out private context uh, that was also spoken about by your panelists tonight so this actually I thought dovetailed very well all right does anybody have uh any questions, comments? Uh, no? All right, so let me give you, you a preview of what uh, the NYCLA ADR committee has coming up in terms of uh, future programming. First, uh, I wanna thank everybody who's here, and I guess everybody who wasn't here, here pre previously for attending, uh, who's not here tonight, who, was, who did attend it, for attending the part 137 arbitration training that we did. It was the first time that we ended up running a statewide program which was run through OCA, the Office of Court Administration. That was a very successful program. In one day, we trained 75 arbitrators through a virtual program that involved a phenomenal uh, array of speakers, more than we even had tonight. Uh, we had something that I think by the time we were done, about 13 different speakers. We had people from American Arbitration Association. We had Jeff Zeno, Clayton Monsi Carroll, uh, and then we had Theo Cheng and uh, Bobby Cajo from uh, Cardozo speaking about diversity it was an absolutely wonderful program. Plus, of course, uh, there was an uh, opportunity to see Chris Nelson and myself. We trained again 75, uh, maybe even a little bit more. I didn't do the exact math on it, 75 arbitrators in one day. So uh, OCA was very happy with that. Uh, to that extent, we are planning uh, at some point and having a, since NYCLA is the only Part 137 program that offers mediation of attorney client fee disputes, we're planning on having a mediation training that's going to involve uh, some role plays. And what we might actually do now is have a contrasting, since we did a contrasting context uh, role play program previously, we may have a contrasting context program now with mediation on one side and arbitration on the other, actually doing a full arbitration role play, which to my knowledge has never been done before in part 137 uh, arbitration training. And uh, it was done in a part 137 mediation training because we did it. Uh, the first time, but uh, what we might do is we might actually take that and now construct some sort of alternative universe and say what would happen if the mediation didn't, uh, wasn't successful and the parties then went to arbitration going on later and we have the materials for doing that. The uh, other thing that's going on in terms of uh, our, our programming that we have uh, coming up is what we're going to do going on from here. You know, what are the future steps forward with respect to the state rules? So as I said before, for those people who are, who are on the committee, we're gonna come up, uh, we have to do this before April 4th. So there's a little bit of a clock on us, not too much though, uh, because we do have a good foundation. We have Ross Cortez's uh, foundation already to start with. And you can see that from the Google doc again, his letter. 
as to uh, the stance from NICLA on the statewide rules. Uh, I happen to agree, and I'm sure you know Nelson and Chris agree. Can't obviously speak for everybody else on the on the committee, but uh, the leadership of the committee certainly agrees that these rules are important. They uh, should be implemented, and obviously, compensation is one of the huge areas uh, that has to be developed further. But in order to do that, again, you really need a strong foundation. And the whole goal of any sort of system, uh, which is going to compensate its uh, mediators and, for that matter, its uh, other dispute resolution professionals, arbitrators, neutral evaluators, and what else, is to have a strong basis and authority for that compensation. Otherwise, what ends up happening is you have people who just will say, there's no authority for this, I'm not going to pay, and then you have issues uh, coming from that. So uh, going forward, we're going to be circulating probably a, a letter uh, to our committee. We'll, we've done this before where we effectively hold a vote and we say you vote by a certain period of time. Now I happen to have a Doodle premium account, which is specifically designed for running polls. So those of you who've uh, been to my organizational meetings for these types of programs know that I use Doodle for that. And you can actually use Doodle to run a poll uh, specifically on, a, on an item. So we could have digital voting on this, which is probably what we're going to do. So if you are a NICLA ADR committee member, uh, and that will have to be checked against Diana Kosanovich's list of our members, uh, you can vote on this. But the general recommendation of the committee is going to be that we adopt uh, the rules more or less as they are, maybe with a little one or two tweaks. Uh, but any major tweaks to them, again, would jeopardize the foundation, as Evan so aptly stated. So we will be uh, recommending the rules should be adopted as they are, and then we'll Take a vote on that, and hopefully there might be enough time for you at NICLA and specifically President Chang to uh, give us an endorsement from NICLA as, a, as an organization as a whole. Just so everybody knows, uh, I was at a meeting of, of the New York State Bar Association. They tried to do that with their entire bar association. That, for the most part, is impossible because while their DRS section, which is the equivalent of our ADR committee, uh, has 2,000 members, the entire uh, body of people who are members of the New York State Bar Association is 75,000. Uh, to get 75,000 people to agree on anything is, uh, or even uh, even even half of that, even the 37,500 to get people to agree on that is an extraordinarily difficult task. So I don't think we're going to be seeing necessarily something come from, uh, from NISPA as itself as, as a whole organization, what they call the big bar, but we may be able to try to do that with NICLA. Okay, uh, so that's where we're going from here, you know, in terms of, of stuff that we have on the horizon. And then, uh, you know, looking towards the future, once we get the rules in place, then the, uh, the goal will be then to turn to uh, the issue of the elephant in the room, you know, compensation. And the other big issue happens to be confidentiality, which is, is talked about in Ross's letter, whether or not there should be waivers required from the neutrals involved, uh, as, well, as well as giving them immunity. Now, just for those people who are practicing uh, using either the local rules or the state rules, here's a quick workaround. There's nothing in the state rules or, for that matter, the various local rules that prohibits neutrals from grafting into their various mediation or neutral evaluation agreements, depending on whatever process they're deciding to use, uh, a provision which goes above and beyond the rules so long as it agree as the parties, two points, so long as A, the parties agree to it, obviously, and B, that it does not directly contradict anything that would be within the rules. So for example, you wanted to put in an indemnification provision to give an immunity uh, provision some sort of teeth, such that if anybody uh, decides to subpoena you as a mediator or to subpoena your notes and work product, uh, you can certainly put that into the various mediation agreements that you would have with the, uh, with the parties. Uh, I personally charge $800 an hour as a penalty for anybody who's going to be trying to do something like that so as to give my immunity some teeth uh, with a strong indemnification provision. And there's no problem with that at all. In fact, my personal part 137 attorney client fee dispute arbitration and mediation agreements contains that. And to date, I have to say that I have not once ever been subpoenaed for my notes or uh, to give testimony, probably because I have that in there and it does have teeth. So just as a practical note, you're always allowed to go above and beyond the rules as long as the parties agree to it and you do not contradict. Uh, what would be an example, for example, of something which would contradict in part 137? Part 137 is completely pro bono and it's stated right there. So to the extent that you would charge a fee in part 137, uh, that would be a problem. That would directly contradict and that would provision would not be enforceable in your agreement. But to the extent that there is you know, nothing we've just said and there isn't, 
in Part 137 with respect to acquiring identification at a specific rate. You're more than free to do that. And I recommend that everybody does that just to protect themselves in you know, the various court annex programs. All right, do uh, you have any questions, observations, what else? We're two minutes over. No? So this meeting is being recorded. Um, it will be available at some point on uh, my YouTube channel. Uh, so when I get the recording, I'll certainly let everybody know. But again, for those people who are NICLA EBR committee members, uh, certainly uh, watch your emails. We'll be having a vote. Uh, and um, ah, thank you very much, William and Beryl. I see uh, the wonderful thanks in the chat. Very, very good to be appreciated. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, so everybody should vote on that. And then hopefully we get our comments out to Ms. Millett from, uh, or I don't know, maybe Ms. Millet, I don't know how she pronounces her last name, from OCA, just like uh, what Ross did. That letter, by the way, his draft letter apparently already went out on March 17th, as I've been told. But the, the general gist of it is basically the same. There was one word change in the, in the final draft of the letter. So we can certainly use that as a basis uh, for going forward. And we will have something out to the membership shortly. Um, with that, I guess we are adjourned. So uh, do watch your emails, watch the portal for instructions on how we're going to do the vote. And uh, for the rest of the NICLA committee year, which effectively ends in August, uh, things are a little uh, up from the pandemic, we still have a bunch of uh, really cool things which are going to be planned, particularly the uh, day two and the, uh, the mediation training for part 137. That's certainly something uh, that's there. And for those people who are it's not an, an actual ADR committee activity, but those people who are part 137 uh, arbitrators and mediators along with NICLA, we are moving towards more of a model of having co-mediators now uh, participate in various mediations of attorney-client fee disputes. So I can just tell you today, I was just assigned one with a person who was originally an observer on an arbitration that I had. It's now coming back to co-mediate with me. Uh, which is going to be very exciting because now we're, we're actually going to be able to do something together as opposed to having him a, a fly on the wall. Although I have to say he was a very patient fly on the wall because that arbitration lasted six hours. Rare, by the way, in a uh, Part 137 case, but it, it, was, it was a long one. But it lasted uh, six hours and he happened to, uh, to like that one. Over two days, by the way. Yeah, well, it wasn't all six hours, but one shot. So that's the, that's the story. Anybody have any questions, comments, observations? Nope. All right, with that, and again, I see Steve is still uh, hung around, to, you know, for doing that. I want to thank Steve. I want to thank John, um, Dan, and Evan, uh, certainly for uh, being with us tonight, as well as obviously also Ross. He couldn't be here, but he sent his, his letter, which is very useful to us. And again, great job to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for uh, all that wonderful information. And uh, again, thank you to all of you, and especially also to Barbara. Oh my God, you're ranging on on two o'clock in the morning at this point. Holy moly. Please, Barbara, get some rest, all right? <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, that, that's dedication to have someone still, still up at two o'clock in the morning. Well, yeah, I'm very interested in this, you know, from what's happened here, really. There's a shades of stuff, you know, and certainly we've had mediators subpoenaed here. And I, I know of a mediator in Florida who publicly has said he was subpoenaed and has now built into his agreement to mediate. I don't know exactly what the terms are, but he's, uh, yeah, he's pretty he's fed probably, up about it. Yeah, he probably put in an identification for you. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, that, that's uh, what I've been taught, you know, all along, and it, it's good advice for as well. So, all right, so Barbara, we'll let you go to bed. Thank you so much for, for staying up and for attending. Thank you for and, asking me. Yeah, and for those who are interested tomorrow night, if you want to come back, we do have mediators meeting online at a much earlier time for, for Barbara and Everybody else in England at five o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Um, still late for her, but not as late as tonight, you know, as, as we're going like that. Five o'clock, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. tomorrow night, the uh, mediators meeting online. Anybody wants to join that group should email Nelson. Also, if you want to save tonight's chat, which I'm doing right now, my particular Zoom account, which is uh, which this is based, allows you to save the chat. So if you want to save your chat feed, go to the three dots that are on the side of the chat. Um, you know, box and you can click on save chat and that will save a text file of everything that was posted tonight, including the Google Doc and what else. All right, uh, I think that wraps us up. So we'll uh, be in touch in cyberspace. And then again, thank you all so much for attending. Have a great night. Take care. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you. Night.